Hello, GoDob Radio. Who is it? Bob Chapman. Yay! I didn't hear from you uh, via email, so I was starting to get worried. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Mr. Chapman. It's love having you here. Oh, no problem. <laughs> I'm always there. Yeah, well, you're the man. I mean, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of uh, new research, and I wanted to bounce a few things off of you. But first, is there anything that in particular that you wanted to talk about? No, let's talk about what you want to talk about. I can always talk. All right. Uh, so what I did was uh, I, I ran across this uh, speaker. Uh, it was like a interview from 1976. His name was Professor Anthony Sutton. And I'll stop he, right there. Okay. Uh, he was one of the most prolific of all conspiracy writers. And uh, he was brilliant at what he did. Uh, he was hiding half the time because they were trying to kill him. And finally he succumbed, I think, naturally. But uh, he's written some great works. Incredible. Uh, and so he named Brown Brothers Harriman, and uh, specifically Arival Harriman, uh, as being a, a prime... Uh, you know, motivator in the you know middle part of the 20th century for the whole new world order, and I'd really never heard of his. You know, I heard that in the background with the railroad baron, but that was his father. But this Aravel Harriman, he is a big. He was a big player in the new world order, wasn't he? Well, Averill is how it's yeah. pronounced, Averill Harriman, and uh, he uh, owned a broker firm, and uh, his partners were. Uh, the Bush family, we'll call it that, without going into all the names. And uh, he uh, operated in Europe extensively, and uh, he was the moving uh, factor in the financing of Adolf Hitler from New York, and as was the Bush family. And uh, the Harrimans have quite a background. Uh, they made their original money in railroading, uh, you know, building railroads instead of railroading people. Um, Pamela Harry, Harriman, um, I don't know how to delicately put this, but uh, she read, she led a very unusual life, let's just put it that way. And um, uh, she, at first, was an embarrassment. Later on, they took it for granted, they being the, the CFR Trilat, Bilderberger types. and um, But yeah, Harriman was the key uh, person behind uh, uh, the business that was done in order to bring Adolf Hitler to power. And um, they work with the Tysons, uh, the steel company, which is still in business. Uh, incidentally, the, uh, the outcome of the Nuremberg war crimes trials was that Tyson, and uh, actually it was called Tyson Hutta at that time, was supposed to be disbanded along with the other steel company. Um, God, I can't think of the name of it, but it'll come to me. Uh, and they were the funnels that were used along with IG Farben and the uh, Hamburg uh, uh, line they were a shipping line group. And in fact, I knew, I met some of those people after the war who were at the Hamburg uh, shipping group. And um, uh, during uh, the 19, I met them during the 60s. And uh, they told me quite about a bit about how the financing was done. Everything in Sutton's book is the best quality. And, uh, but anyway, um, yes, Harriman was a big wheel, and and um, and the Bushes, and uh, and that whole you know family were involved in it. Well, um, according to Wikipedia, bbh. dot com. That's the, they have a website. Brown Brothers Harriman is uh, the world, or the America's largest uh, private bank. And, uh, you you rarely hear about it. And it was just funny. Uh, I don't know how often, uh, but I usually go to Kitco, you know, to check out the news feeds that they have. And uh, they had a, uh, a 
uh, announcement was actually made by Brown Brothers Harriman today. It's funny enough. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, they mentioned that uh, Honig is out at the Federal Reserve. I thought he was one of the he was one of the salient speakers over there. I, I bet you he's uh, actually related to the Honig family that is uh, part owner of the Federal Reserve I, originally. Uh, but they're getting Could Honig be. out of there. Yeah. And he was one of the critics of this uh, loosey goosey policy. So they basically have eliminated the dissent on the Federal Reserve uh, Board and put a bunch of uh, rubber stampers in there, I guess, to this whole uh, $100 trillion uh, quantitative easing for the whole world. Now, that's the new plan. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, that's the game they're going to play. They're going to bust everybody. Except themselves, of course, and they want to end up with all the marvels. And in that process, uh, when you create massive quantitative e easing country to country, uh, what you end up is with hyperinflation because there's too much money out there running around. And the more that's out there, the less it's worth. worth. And so that's how Weimar came about when they had too much money chasing too few goods. And people would get paid, hand the money to their wife. She'd take the wheelbarrow and go down and buy everything she could, you know, with the butcher or whatever. And um, that's what this will drive eventually to. And then the, the, you'll have a collapse into a deflationary depression, and they'll pick up the pieces and tell you what to do. And I got news for them. It's not going to happen that way this time. And incidentally... The only asset you can own during inflation, hyperinflation, which is somewhat different, and deflation is gold and silver, coins, bars, and shares. So remember that. It's the only safe place. Um, so, you know, James G. Rickards mentioned this situation on King World News. I think that's where I heard about it on Saturday or Sunday. Uh, this past weekend, and then so uh, it was confirmed. It's the uh, up there in Davos is where they're talking about this. So this is going on right now. And he mentioned how they're they have got the world figured out. Who, those people that are those nations that don't have uh, debt, you know, that aren't in hock, they need to be. So they're actually looking to like cover the world in liquidity, but it's all securitized through bonds and stuff, uh, so that the governments are obligated. So basically. That's their – instead of backing off, they're just ratcheting the whole pressure game up, it looks like. And, uh, mm -hmm. Like you said, And it's to be expected. Up. And all these people who think gold and silver are going to get down are crazy. What's going to happen is this money is going to make the stock market go higher, and somewhere along the way, bingo, it's just going to collapse. And I don't know when that time is, but I certainly wouldn't want to be there. Now, that doesn't include gold and silver shares – because in both inflationary and deflationary markets, they do extraordinarily well. But um, the, the whole thing is riding for a fall. And I think this fall is going to take a little bit longer than what people anticipated. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, 2020 or 2025. I'm talking about the next few years. Although it could last that long, but I rather think that uh, – because of what they just announced in liquefying the world, we'll call it, um, I think that instead of pulling the plug soon, uh, they're going to play this game a lot longer and a lot bigger to bring everybody down. And they know that people like me are on talk radio and also uh, – in the internet and in publishing and everything. And we're informing people all over the world what's going on and who's doing it and why they're doing it. And so, you know, the question arises, they, first of all, can't go, can't go back. They can't reverse what they've done. And that reversal process ended after June of 2003. And so from here on out, uh, they're on their own. And if they're not successful, they're all going down. And they know that. 
and I make it quite plain in all the programs I'm on, that we know what they're doing, and we're going to come after them. Essentially, it looks like they're doubling down on the whole situation. Uh, Good way to put I, it. It looks like uh, people are like are uh, you know moving back to the Dow because it, it's got to go up, I guess. Uh, gold, silver uh, weren't, aren't getting crushed today, but they got crushed uh, you know the day before uh, Monday, I guess it was. And then of course, well, the look, they've been down. They've been down for three weeks, and the reason why is number one. Uh, the insiders needed gold and gold and silver shares down to make silver go down so that they could cover their naked short positions. That's what this originally was all about. And then you have the FOMC, FOMC meeting for two days coming up today and tomorrow. And then you have, or tomorrow and the next day, I don't know which, and then you have the State of the Union Address. Why do you think the stock market's up almost to 12,000? Because they want to make everything look good. And they have the, the Chinese premier come, and everything is done behind closed doors. You know what they talked about. But I got a report today from the Eagles Forum, which is Phyllis Shapley, who's been around longer than I have. And so she's very, uh, everything she does is verified. And she says that the Chinese are going to be given free trade zones all over the United States, which are not controlled by the U.S. government, and they will have these zones where they can manufacture or whatever they're going to do, and they're going to be given the land by the United States government. And, of course, there's no question in my mind this is being done because they're holding probably... 1.2 to 1.4 trillion dollars worth of dollars are dollar denominated assets. And so uh, that's going on and nobody knows about it. It's part of the Hegelian dialectic where you've, they, we, they've built China up into a formidable force, Bill Clinton selling the rocket technology, etc. But going on for 25 years, that's what Sutton pointed out. He, in 1976, he said presently he felt that China was the one that they were going to build up next. Sure shit, he was right. And so now that they're a formidable force, someone we have to care about uh, militarily, they, they make a concession uh, to the land rights now of our sovereign country. So that further erodes that and uh so basically it's all it really is uh disintegrating i mean to the point where the founding fathers what they made for us here this republic is going to have uh, it's going to be like a piece of swiss cheese man <laughs> well they're going to do what they're going to do and uh we have to try to take measures to stop them although it gets more and more difficult all the time because you have a Congress, the House and the Senate, 95% of which has been purchased by the people from behind the scenes. And uh, and then you have a court system that doesn't work and hasn't worked for a long, long time, which is totally corrupt, incidentally. And so, you know, the avenues open to the average American citizen are not great. And uh, if it doesn't work that way, uh, there's going to be revolution. I mean, so basically, she's saying that they're going to have uh, land where they're going to be. It's going to be like it's going to be like an Indian reservation or something. It won't actually. Uh, US exactly, law exactly, just like that. Can't go there. They don't pay any taxes. It's a total sellout. That's shocking, man. I mean, it's oh, it's just terrible. Oh, they, they they are as arrogant. They think they know it all, and they're going to do what they want. Well, I get news for them. It's not going to happen that way. And no doubt, uh, they will. Uh, part of the deal is that there will be probably a flood of uh, now Chinese immigration via this uh, conduit, uh, more than, you know. And so uh, it's slowly dissolving America as we know it now into something totally uh, unexpected, really. Uh and so, uh, you know, as an American, where do you hang your hat at this point? And 
And it's all based on, well, what are we going to do? We owe them the money. We can't pay them. The, the, the currency is uh, you know, worthless. They're pissed. They want us to make a concession, a negotiation. This seemed reasonable. They promised to hire some Americans. There's probably some rationale. They go back on all of that stuff anyways. Well, they will, I'm sure. And uh, I thought that, you know what I thought the Chinese would do? I thought the Chinese were part of the uh, negotiation over this matter would have been to say, okay, U.S. out of the Pacific theater. You know, out of uh, Okinawa and Thailand uh, up there or Subic Bay, you know, get out of all those positions there and then we'll let you off the hook. But they actually put a more of a forward look to it. Hey, we want to be now based in your country. That's that. That's incredible. Very uh, audacious. Well, that's the way these people are. And uh, uh, they can curl things and uh, they think they'll be able to continue to do so. And uh, I, I think, you know, everybody's been expecting more. We still might get one as a, as a diversion. But by both sides, if we have that war, there won't be nuclear weapons used. And the reason why is if they do, uh, the world will be uninhabit un uninhabitable. And so I think you'll see limited-type wars. So the, it's the, it's the, uh, the U.S. sovereignty being uh, disintegrated slowly, and so this new, uh, you know, uh, having them here, that's another example of it. Uh, not protecting the borders, that was one thing. It never ceases. It just kind of like builds, you know. That's a, the other side. It's just continuing to ratchet it up, do more things, stay active, and now the thing with the Chinese, if that really plays out like that, wow, okay, so then, then what? After that, and it's just like a slow delete dissolving of America, into this uh, other thing. I mean, first it was the Panama Canal, this, that, and the other thing. You look at all the, the timeline of it. This, is, this uh, like Sutton points out, there's a lot of planning that goes into this whole Rubik's Cube on how they're redoing the world. You're right. So 24-7, millions of people are employed by these people coming up uh, with ideas of how to enslave us. Yeah, so when they coat the world in a, that new debt, hundred trillion dollars over ten year blanket, uh, everybody will be indebted and uh, pay, just trying to pay the interest on the principal of these bonds, etc. That they will, uh, you know, use to secure this uh, new loan out to the world, whether they need it or not. You're going to get it, so you can be forced to be consumers. And I see the whole—that's the whole thing. I mean, right there. So we're screwed. Dan, I don't think there's. A, I think if you can wake people up and everything, but the thing is, is that okay? After you get woken up, you got to do something. That's the only fall I have with Alex Jones. He says everybody wake up, and I've learned a lot from his research. But there's no part two to his plan, in my opinion. There's no. What are we going to do next? I mean, what are we going to do? We're woken up. Now what? You know what I'm saying? I know. And uh, he does uh, a number of things. Of course, you know, it's all really education. And uh, But the people, as you say, have to have a plan in using that education. But he does that from time to time. And uh, I think he'll continue to do so. Well, he's the man to do it. I mean, uh, he has the followers. Uh, but there is no plan to... I mean, nothing is done to stop any of this stuff. It's all rolling forward. But really, the people are kind of screwed because uh, they don't have the money. They're, there's the fear of, uh, and they already have the FEMA camps. They kind of got that in the background for you. They're kind of like, it's out there. Everybody's in the back of everybody's mind. Any uh, resistance to this uh, plan of, you know, that's uh, being implemented now, uh, they're, they're ready for you. To, and people know that in the back of their mind. So I really think... Uh, I don't know what's going to save us. Some people think the aliens, the Palladiums, are going to come down and save us at this. That's, there's a, there's a, that's how, that's how kind of desperate we're getting. But that, on the other hand, I've heard that the Palladiums won't help us until we help ourselves. So I don't know. It's really scary. But um, all I noticed is that Platinum and Palladium are getting crushed today, which I didn't expect that. Well, it's all part of the takedown of the commodity gold-silver area, running the stock market up at the same time and making sure the bond market remains firm. And the bond market uh, has had a hard time lately. Uh, they, they have no trouble, they, the Fed, <laughs> have no trouble controlling the short end of the market. It's the long end. 
It's the uh, 7 and 10 and 30 year paper. And uh, that's not easy. And there's vast amounts of money involved, and the leverage is, you know, these people are using 100 to 1. And so uh, you have the kind of volatility that you have because government's creating it. I mean, it all goes back to the working group and financial markets. Ronald Reagan should have never instituted and signed uh, the executive order. Absolutely not. But, uh, you know, his sons say that uh, he, he, he didn't have dementia then, but uh, I know better. He did, and he did everything they told him to do. He was out of it half the time. And he just became a dummy for them. And of yeah, course, after the you, like, I'm a, I was like a, I still am a big fan of Ronald Reagan and everything like that because theoretically he got us out of the Cold War in quotes. But when you analyze it through Sutton's work, that it's just a question of the Hegelian dialectic being brought to an end. They built up the Soviet Union to become a rival, a, a viable rival. They weren't viable on their own. They had to be helped because they could, they didn't have it together, technically, material-wise, whatever, as he points out and he documents. And then so once we build up the rival on one side, then the vast military-industrial complex builds up a response to rival it, and then we have this fear factor, and then that came to an end, and uh, they got Putin in there, He's re reclaimed Russia back for the Russian people, and now he's having trouble. No doubt, those uh, if it's Islamic uh, bombers, no doubt they're being funded by CIA Mossad. You got to believe that, or you know, British MI5 or something. It got to be behind supporting them and everything, right? I think uh, you're right. Uh, that is distractions, um, disruption. Uh, in order to get people's eye in Russia, in this case, uh, off, you know, looking the other way. And um, you're going to get lots of that. That Tunisian coup, I don't know whether the MI6 and, and the CIA did that, but it has all the earmarks of their kind of an operation. And I, I studied that stuff years ago at and before, you know, Sutton really came on the scene as a writer, uh, because I was in counterintelligence, and I saw these things happening. And uh, one of the reasons I didn't stay was I didn't want to become involved in it. Oh, really? I guess that is part of counterintelligence, isn't it, in a, uh, is uh, starting up crap in other people's countries. I mean, just... <laughs> it's unbelievable what they do. All they are is an arm of the establishment, so to speak. Uh, if you look at the members of the OSS and, and Donovan, uh, who ran it, and his successor, uh, they were all Wall Street types. They all went to Ivy League schools, except a handful of people like me. And um, the only reason they wanted me is I was very bright. And they figure, oh, maybe we can roll this guy and maybe he'll be good for us. Give it a shot. You know, it can't hurt anything. And uh, But when I saw some of the things that are going on, I said, forget it. I mean, it's really pure evil. Uh, and the manufacturing aspect of it, it's so skullduggery to the nth degree and most people don't think in those terms. And then when you combine it with the propaganda of, uh, you know, the uh, bourgeois respectability, it's everything but that. It's just the most, it's as bad as humanity, humanity can get. And we are really trapped in this cycle now. Uh, and they, I, I think, I think they're going to get their way. I, I see it so well done, so well financed. People are apathetic. The general population doesn't know what to do. They recognize that something's rotten here. But really, what can you do other than what really what you need to do? And, of course, you can't say that publicly because then they have a reason to come down on you. But I think you know uh, what really needs to be done. Uh, the cancer needs to be excised, physically excised from the body humanity. Other than that, 
They're going to be able to play us like a fiddle. Well, I think you're right. Um, you always hope for the best um, and try the best you can to make that happen. But it is very overwhelming to people at times. But if you ignore it, um, as as an American in this case, uh, you're only in, inviting your own dem demise. Uh, it's the young people who are going to suffer more than anybody because, I mean, if you're 50 year old or you've lived at least half of your life, and uh, and so you get less to lose as a human being as far as uh, longevity is concerned. But uh, the the situation uh, is that they want to control us. And people like you and I, we're not controllable. We'll be immediately liquidated. Right. Um, well, the thing with uh, – we have a guy in here, Aaron McCollum, that has been come on the show and everything. He's one of the young uh, people in the truth movement, uh, you know, kind of passing the baton off. To, like People like you will be passing the baton off to him. So people like uh, Aaron McCollum, and he – had an issue where he was uh, recently, like his uh, Hotmail account, they suspended it or something because there was a claim that uh, he put uh, pornographic material up on it. And, uh, of course, he says, this is no way, not at all. And that was a way of character assassination right there because he's so outspoken and everything. And uh, a big deal, if it, even if it was, pornographic materials, like you can't go to like a million websites easily right now and watch all the porn you wanted to. What's the big deal, right? <laughs> Posterous, and they're all behind it too. Google has a. I know somebody about. Well, I won't go into this, but uh, you know, character assassination. He's already kind of experienced it. He's already kind of targeted. They they know about him, and they're gonna just start to make his life miserable, I guess. And that's usually the case. That started for me in 1967, and it's been ongoing. I just don't let it bother me. Uh, well, I did want to ask you a question about that, but it might be a sensitive subject, but if you have any idea what I'm talking about, you can answer if you want to, otherwise I will bring it up again. But, uh, basically, uh, I think that's why we're in like the survive and thrive type mentality here. Another guy, George for title that was on recently, uh, with you here on the show, he, that's what his thing is like, you know. Yeah, we're in crap, but basically, if your mindset is that you're aware of the double scam going on here, the illusion, then you can uh, do things to kind of basically try to survive, you know, make a pragmatic best of, uh, you know, what, we, what, what the cards that were dealt here, which is like, you know, as Alex Jones pointed out, that's a big thing for me was learning about fluoride based on his uh, teachings, you know, through his show and everything, and that's one example. Uh, the fluoride is a big thing that they use. Right, uh, and so if you survive by not drinking the fluoride water, you're beginning to survive it. What their what their plan is for you as you know, the humanity. So uh, along those lines, like what food? I guess that it goes down to what food you take, avoiding the inoculations. So there's like things you could do to survive it if you're aware the scam is in place. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm carrying a piece on vaccinations in my health section tomorrow. Um, and it was done by, I forget who, but the doctor who was interviewed is now deceased. And uh, he uh, uh, he admitted that in these vaccines that they put things in there to expedite AIDS and cancer and on and on. It's dreadful. I mean, these people are monsters. Absolutely. They might run around in there. Four thousand dollar suits and and be chauffeured from here to there in their bulletproof vehicle, but uh, they're not going to make it. They're just not going to make it. There's too many people in the world who know what they're up to now, and you know they've got to be very concerned. In spite of the arrogance that you see them display. Cutting out the cancer, that's the only thing that will work at this time. They're so stubborn, they're they unconscionable, 
there's no reaching them. I don't think with any sort of reason. There's no backing up. This whole idea with this, uh, you know, creating a new bubble. Basically, that's what the thing is. The hundred trillion is about. It's a new bubble to cover all the old bubbles. <laughs> so, you know. And well, what you can do after you try them is to uh, uh, use their program and a euthanasia on them. Yeah, right. Yeah, and they're all a bunch of, uh, you know, they've already uh, lived the balance of their life. They've become such good scammers. Yeah, it's time for them to, uh, yeah. And the thing is, a lot of these characters, like uh, I think Alice Jones even talks about how, like, the Queen in, in England and stuff, they have their own foods. They don't even eat common people's food. They have all their organic foods that they grow on their uh, plantation or whatever, right? So, and they all, live, right. they all live in their, to their 95 or 98 years old. And because, uh, they know what the scam is because they're putting it out there. They're putting the poison out there for the population who's dying off in America at 77 or 76. According to CIA.gov, uh, life expectancy, the latest report from 2010 says that we are number 49 in the USA. So. Everything we're doing, like number 10 is Canada. You hear about how bad the uh, can Canadian healthcare system is. Well, maybe it doesn't have to be as good as America's because they're living way older than us, relatively speaking. I mean, they're number 10 in life expectancy. We're 49. So no matter how bad things might be in Canada about their medical system, bottom line, maybe the people don't need it. I mean, because they're – out. <laughs> bottom line, you know what I'm talking about. doesn't matter anything else. And they have a you know, well, I think you, you, you know you got to look at a whole segment of the society in America, and in, in part in Canada, but especially in America, uh, you have groups of people who eat absolutely the wrong foods, and it's usually the lower class, the lower middle class, because they really don't know any better, nor do they care. Yeah. So they die younger. And uh, and. Uh, uh, any like when people are living uh shorter in this mid range uh like between like sixty and seventy five if that's the life expectancy there's a huge block of people within that uh bracket that means they're kind of like struggling along they're not like living super until they're seventy five and then croaking they're probably like fifteen years of like struggling with a disease that finally takes them out after when they reach 75 so they're consuming all kinds of medicaid and other kind of resources based upon like you mentioned their lifestyle so basically when you have a real healthy population that is is living to its maximum they're not consuming as much of the system because they're generally healthier not consuming the resources so it's like a double edge it's a double thing like that you know when it's screwed it's really screwed <laughs> and you got to believe that the fluoride water and the aluminum oxide and stuff that they're shooting up into the uh, atmosphere, you know, blowing out these planes' rear ends. Have you uh, have you done any uh, work with the chemtrail uh, situation? Not really. Only as a uh, observer. Uh, there are lots of people who know lots about more about it than I do, but and it's not good. And uh, now they figured out that the planes are drones, so that you know the flyers. Uh, don't uh, die. That's a good point. Yeah, because there would be some, uh, you know, intermittent leakage and little stuff like that that, you know, you know, blow back and would make its way up this way or that way, you know. That's a good point. So, wow. They, they, they got that figured out. Yeah, really good. Uh, do you think it's the, do you think the chemtrails is going on all over the world now? I mean, obviously, that's probably what I know it is. Do. Really? I travel extensively, and it's everywhere. Jesus. Everywhere that I've been. Well, I did some research on it. Over here in Mount Shasta, you know, western United States, uh, big mountain, you know, has a huge snow cap on it all the time, usually. They did some tests on it. I saw it on YouTube. Uh, seven different people. They even had, like, a school did a project where they, uh, like, these little girls or something were, like, tested the stuff. And they were there speaking about it from uh, you know, all the way up to older men. And they said it's, like, 10,000 times the federal limit of uh, aluminum oxide, barium, stromium, all these different uh, metals, you know, oxides of metals. And it has no place on the snowpack, you know. And the, the, the creepy thing is, is that a lot of uh, bottled water... It's just like, uh, you know, spring water or these type of things where it comes off a snowcap. 
and they don't really filter it, like purify it. They just, that's the whole thing of it. It's raw water, you know, or something. It's supposed to be, you know, it's pure, right? It comes off the snow. No, the snow is corrupted, man. It's like, shh, don't drink that. And that's a lot of times people don't know that. Like, they don't want to drink the fluoride water, so they go to the spring water. But the spring water's got, a, it doesn't have fluoride in it. <laughs> it's got all your metals in it that will take you out a different way. So I drink distilled water from the store in the hopes that, you know, by distilling the water, you leave everything uh, down, and only the vapor gets condensed and creates the uh, you know a, 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 you know uh, water in another jug over there, so to speak. Well, um, distill is probably the best way to go. You got to reverse osmosis as well. But um, I've used both for I don't know fifty years, sixty years. Really? And uh, we've done everything you right. On, you were up on this a while back then. Yeah, I think we got um, involved in a healthy way of uh, life um, about 50 years ago. A little shy of that. Um, in fact, you know, Jack Elaine died the other day, was 96. And I knew Jack slightly. And uh, I used to work out at Jack Lane's on the Miracle Mile in L.A. on Wilshire Boulevard. And uh, I could, I probably, uh, I used to go usually three times a week. And um, <laughs> the guy that was always there when I was there was Regis Philbin. And Regis never worked out hardly. I mean, he get on that thing where you walk, you know. And he'd do that, and he was talking to his buddy who was always with him. And uh, I guess they were talking about their uh, television movie stuff. And uh, I talked to him occasionally, but uh, he was there all the time. And, uh, God, he was always so skinny. You know, he looked at me with this robust uh, Charles uh, Atlas-like physique and, and just turn away, you know, you know, how do you get that way? But uh, um, Jack lent a tremendous amount of knowledge to people and helping people live healthy. And he died of old age. Very simply, his body finally gave out. And I'm sure what he did probably allowed him to live longer than he would have otherwise. And he was really with it at 96, but... It started to break down. He got pneumonia and died, and and that's what happens to people who do those things. But I used to um, do the same things that he did, um, but that I wasn't famous for it. I did it because I thought it was a good thing to do. And uh, there was another guy named Gypsy Boots that was running around during the 60s and 70s, and he used to... Um, Uh, He used to uh, work for Kyolic, which is a a Japanese form of, uh, um, I'm thinking of the word in three different languages, but not in English, in garlic. (laughs) And I still to this day take it. Yeah, we do about 110 vitamins, minerals, and herbs a day. Uh, We don't do as much as we used to. Uh, we spread it out a little bit over two or three days because your digest- digestive tract can't handle it as well when you get older. And um, I do Dr. Strauss's heart drops. As a matter of fact, my wife had a bypass, and it, it was hereditary. And um, after that, they said, you know, you're going to have to have another one because of this, that, and the other thing. And so I came across these heart drops because somebody I knew sat behind beside this fellow in a in a in a plane in Canada and I got to talking. And um and so he got a hold of the stuff and then I got a hold of it and that was about eight years ago. And uh, we take it every day and it obviously works pretty good because my wife never had to have the other side done after her first oh. bypass. And uh, so I guess it's, you know, what you do and how you do it. And uh, you got to keep after it. I mean, you you have to 
do what you have to do. And if you don't, every time that you don't do it, you're going to die sooner. And then again, there's people who are very, very unlucky who have genetic, genetic, what would we call it, uh, weaknesses. Uh -huh. And then they're going to get ill anyway. And there's nothing they can do about it. Well, even Arnold, he had some defective thing. He had to have a bypass, I think, Arnold, you know, the, the governator. So, I mean, even the guy who? who was super butt, Arnold Schwarzenegger, had to have a bypass. Yeah, but usually that that's caused by, um, well, a number of factors. I'm not a doctor. But, you know, it can happen to anybody. I mean, I go into the doctor, and, and uh, I don't know, every six months or so. And, you know, they take my blood pressure. Uh, and, you know, normally they'll take it when you're laying down. And I was there not too long ago. So they said, um, uh, let's do this sitting up. And I did it, and he, and he looks at me and says, I've, I've never had a 75-year-old patient that had 120 over 65. <laughs> wow. Really? And That's what yours is? Oh, yeah. When was that? Recently? Hmm, three months ago. Jesus. That's very good. 120 over 65. Good. Listen to this. My pulse beat varies from 60 to 80. It's usually around 65. It's All like right. the living dead, you know. <laughs> El Zombo. All right. All right, check this out. Here's a story but, uh, that's along those lines. I think what, here's what explains it. Here's my, here, you, know why, you know why you have that? Here's my guess. I know this uh, older man... Uh, you know, roughly your age, uh, he was living in San Francisco, which is kind of a colder area, kind of damp, coldy area, right? And uh, he went to Thailand to live. He'd been going to, oh yeah, here's the story. He was at Kaiser, they gave him blood thinners. Okay, so he was on blood thinners for a while. Yeah, cool then. Right. And then he, uh, he, he cruises over to Thailand to live three, four months, and midway in the journey over there, are, uh, he, he's getting blood through the stool. So he gets Kaiser on the blower, and he says, what's up with this? And they say, well, they don't know. They, somebody says, okay, uh, just try stop taking the blood thinners for it and see what happens. Perfect. Stops taking the blood thinners. No more blood through the stool. No problem. Uh, he deduces, because of Thailand's hot and humid weather, it's always, you know, unless you're in the air conditioner, even at night, it's 80, 85 degrees. You know how it is in the tropics and everything like that, or in Southeast Asia, that area, you know, same probably at whatever, uh, equi equi equatorial type regions. Uh, that's what does it. But all you, your body gets, uh, it's, your blood becomes less viscous in the hotter, humid areas, so you don't really need, that helps you live longer, I think, uh, being in those, uh, you know, uh, if you've got carotid arteries, pretty much, then you should be in a hotter, humid environment. It makes your blood less viscous. What do you think about that? Well, how do you compare that to the people who live in Nepal who live to be 120 and 30 and 40 years old and uh, have the same result? I don't know. <laughs> There's no answer. Now, what are you doing trying to spank me like that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I couldn't resist it, but, you, you know, you don't know. We don't know, and I don't think uh, medical science as yet knows. And and so, we, you know, you, you go to where, where, where it feels good. Well, you, know, you know, your body and your mind feel well. If, if it's in Miami, that's okay. Um, if it's in Thailand, that's okay. Uh, if it's in Nepal or in the Sierras, you know, at 8,500 feet, that's okay, too. Whatever your body acclimates to and works well with. Yeah, bottom line. Uh, well, the thing with Canada, like I was talking to some people up in Canada, and they were telling me, like, they don't pay health insurance like to some private provider. It's part of the system. And so, you know... I'm getting the more and more I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about expatting out. Uh, this place is going nuts. It keeps ratcheting up. There's no end to this uh, Bolshevik, uh, you know, developments. And geez, if if he gets elected for another term, 
I am definitely out of here. Because that is when, if he becomes a lame duck uh, Marxist, <laughs> oh, no, it's going to be bad. So, yeah, but I'm thinking about doing it. Uh, mentally and physically, there are better options out there. And like you speak about Jack Lane, he lived basically 20 years longer than the average American does. Actually, uh, probably men are, are, are lower than the, the 49 rate. You know, we're ranked number 49 in the world, according to the CIA. That's, that's both men and women. But women live a couple, two, three years older. So uh, he, you know, he beat the thing by over 20 years, the average over 20 years by what, drinking his juices and uh, strenuous exercise on a regular basis. That's what you're doing, right? If you're, are you walking 18 holes or nine holes every day or something or what? No, 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 I don't do that. And um, what I do do is I play 36 on the weekend and I have a golf cart. But I still get enough exercise. I'm not 8,500 feet. And so, you know, you, you've got to work hard because of the thinness of the air. And um, yep. and so it, it seems to fit. And then I have a masseuse on Monday morning because what happens when you're old, uh, your circulation, your nervous system, and those things, they don't work, work as well. And so you have to have an expert do that deep massage, whatever it's called. And that's what this fellow does, and it's fantastic. And uh, so I don't get much cramping or um, I I don't um, get much pain. I 100% agree and with Most you, men my age, they're racked with pain. In fact, when he works on me, he, he's, he's in the 60s. He says, you're Superman. He says, I never heard of anybody like you that can put up with the pain I give you. Oh. It's true. <laughs> I have this tolerance for pain that is unbelievable. So what is he working at you on, like a shiatsu, a shiatsu type uh, thing where he's just like uh, working you? <laughs> well, I tell you, uh, he digs in there, and uh, I don't know what it's called, but it works. <laughs> no, I don't mind. Uh, well, Thai massage is that way. They have uh, pressure points that they work on your feet and other stuff and uh, use the That's elbow. what this fellow does. Oh, okay. That's what yeah. he does. There's something to that. In fact, he I, starts there. Because, you know, after about, I don't know, maybe a year, you know, he knows my good points and bad points. He knows what usually has to be worked on. And he said to me, did you have any pain? You know, you speak Spanish. I don't. Uh, I, I, get an, I know enough to get along with him. And, like, I had a, a pain in the middle of the bottom of my foot. I don't know why. And he says, oh, I know what that is. And bingity, bing, bing, and he fixes it. That's one luxury most Americans can't enjoy on a regular basis is a good massage uh, workover like that. When you're when I'm in Thailand or you're uh, wherever you are, it's very reasonable. I mean, shoot, in Thailand you can get a, a one-hour foot massage for, what? well, uh, I would say for $10.00. Uh, and it's it's so incredible. So actually, it's foot, body, time massage. You can have one of three different types for ten dollars for an hour. Some places are cheaper. It's like a, get two hours for that. In some joints and everything. And if you pay a little extra money, you get a little extra service. And I will just not even leave it right there. But uh, and it's I go almost every day uh, to to the muscles almost worked off my bones. Basically, I kind of want. <laughs> It's like no longer attached to the bones. It's so man- kneaded, you know what I'm saying? But I love it. Yeah. After you've had a killer one-hour foot massage and you put your shoes back on, you walk on like a cloud or something like that. It is really uh, incredible. So I'm thinking more and more uh, expatting out of America. There's so many reasons to do it. Outside of if, – if you can make money in America and become rich, okay, then you're doing America right. But if it, if you can't – uh, at this point, there's no reason to be, uh, you know, uh, patriotic or something. If they're going to give China away these little areas of a country, and they're giving everything, you know, what do you have anymore? You know, so okay, go with the flow. Okay, we got the new world. It's all everybody's world. We're all like, there's no more boundaries and every, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, just go someplace else. You know, where you get more bang for your buck. There's a lot of places you can still get more bang for your buck. And they're not so sinister. When you go through those East Asian airports, they never do anything creepy to you like they do here. It's such a contrast. Well, they're not creepy people. 
These people here. You live in a corporatist fascist state. I mean, this is just like Nazi Germany in the United States. By comparison, when you go through customs, like to enter the country in Thailand, for example, there's some guys that are like in white pants, white shoes, a shirt. They're all kind of like jovial. They just kind of like look at you really quick and they just say, go through. They don't touch you. They don't come up to you. They don't try to like be domineering over you. They just kind of look at you. They almost pass everybody. I've never been stopped once there. You know, they're just kind of like looking you over real quick and they tool, you know, and they're just off to something else. They pre- they, they pretend not to even hardly even notice you. They're kind of like talking all the time with each other, you know. Uh, you know how it goes in other countries. This country, you come to you come to the police state. You totally feel it when you come in here. You're like, oh, God, America, ugh, you know, and it's just so <sighs> – They've ruined this country, man. It's got, you know, I don't know, but uh, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, if you can make a mint while you're here in America, fine. I mean, that's what the immigrants come here to do. But if you're not doing it, if you're not making a mint here, you're just kind of like, you know, sustenance or something, just existing. There's other countries you can exist to, and uh, probably for longer. Well, I've lived over half the world. And there's lots of nice places to live. And um, if you don't have to, uh, you shouldn't put up what is going on in America. And if you feel like you want to leave, give it a shot. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. At least I'm going to get another passport, you know, so I have an option. I have a, you know, exit stage left. Well, you usually got to spend five years in that country to do that. Well, check it out. And you, out the- usually you, you have to speak their language, too. All right, let me ask you something. It's not as easy as it sound to get a decent passport. A decent well, passport is one that you can use in just about every country. Okay, that's a good technical point there. That, right, I know what you're saying there. Um, what about the Dominican Republic, though? Have you done any analysis on that? Well, if, you know, yeah, it's, it's okay, but there's certain countries that you have to get visas for to use that passport. And so it's not a panacea. The pain in the neck because, oh, Dominican Republic, okay. Yeah, we give you like a one week in our country, and after that we want you out. <laughs> you know? Yeah, every country has a, is a different status, uh, you know, in every other different country. Some people, hey, six months they get or one month, uh, and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So, right, I see what you're saying. And plus, you got a Dominican Republic. I mean, what kind of social structure do they have there, like, for – you know, you want to go to a good socialist country like uh, maybe like Norway or something like that, where you can get on the dole. You know, when you get as you get older or something. You know what I mean? So, uh, you got to think in those terms or whatever. Uh, but I, I'm definitely thinking one way or the other. It's you know, it's, it's you got to have a second option. Geez, look at all these Zionists. They all have dual passports and everything. They're playing games. So you know, I think having a being a dual passport holder is probably a a necessity, man. If you're going to be a truther or something. Just because, like yourself, uh, if they if they've basically come to the truther and they say, "Listen, truther, you know, you've been causing us a big pain in the neck. Uh, basically, you know, shut up, or uh, we're going to make it really tough on you." And at that, when you get that kind of a message sent to you, that's when you want to have that second passport because you just, you'll choose. Well, I could keep squawking here, or I could just bail. Maybe do a little squawking. I think I'm going to leave. Mm-hmm. You're right. Um... <clears throat> you, you think some of these show? people out here would would like to find out how to get a free introductory copy to the International Forecaster? Oh, definitely. <laughs> Time is closing in. The International Forecaster is about business, finance, economics, social and political issues all over the world, although in this program we don't talk about it. And we publish uh, on Wednesdays and Saturdays, runs around 40 pages each time. And we have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the Internet. And everything that you need to know is in this publication every week. You get a free introductory copy by going to the internationalforecaster.com. The International, F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R.com. Or www.intforecaster.com. That's int forecaster.com if you have a question you can email us and that's bob b-o-b at int forecaster.com bob at int 
forecaster.com or you can call toll free 877-479-8178 that's 877-479-8178 and you can get either copy there and they have a special offering there for those of you who would like to become subscribers they have a free one year subscription they offer a deal there and it is fantastic take advantage of it all right just want to say two things here. I have one statement. I would like to ask you a question in closing, and then I know you got to go, uh, which sucks. But anyways, I love the one hour you spent here is like gone by like in five minutes. It seems like okay on YouTube. So I have some people. The Bob Chapman channel, Economy Meltdown. They've been uh, taking the show from here and transcribing it to YouTube so people can listen to it, and they do it in one video as opposed to like ten videos because they know what they're doing and they have that type of a YouTube channel where they get it all the whole uh, thing in uh, one video and. 7,000 uh, views or 7,000 listens, however you want to look at it, of Bob Chapman on Go Knob Radio in the past uh, one week. 7,000 views, listens, whatever you want to call it, in the past week, Bob Chapman on my show. So you're getting out there, I'm getting out there, and what your uh, uh, you know, advertisement to, or uh, offer on the International Forecaster is also getting out there. That's a fact. And seven thousand a week is darn good. I'm stoked. And uh, and they want your other, your new interviews every time they're willing to put that up on their channel. And they have like six to eight thousand subscribers uh, each. Of these people, so it's, they're they're out there to a lot of people. And also, uh, Bob, in closing, uh, those people that are in the gold silver market and stuff like that, with it getting crushed, like what kind of thing do you have to say to those people? We we invest for long term. We're not interested in the short term gyrations and so uh, I don't pay much attention to it uh, if it goes down you just buy more if you can okay fair enough pretty simple and uh, if they want any advice all they have to do is email me bob at intforecaster.com it's pretty simple yep well thank you very much again bob uh, for coming on the show I uh, and I really wish uh, if you could take a time again to, uh, next week uh, to be on the show, it would be very appreciated. People are listening to you, and they're also listening to you on GoNop Radio for sure. What uh, what day? Uh, can we make it next Tuesday? Week from today? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, thank you very much. No problem. All, All right, right, I, I got the schedule well, right in my hand. Okay, I'll see you next week. And if you want, we can talk more about stocks. Okay, sounds like a plan. Okay, great. I'll see thank you then. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.